Hi, everybody. This is Marlene with Miami Ghost Chronicles Stories of the Supernatural. And I hope you enjoy this new show, whether you're viewing it on the internet or listening to a podcast version of the episode. I do want to thank you for being part of my audience. You can also find links to videos or podcasts on MiamiGhostChronicles.com, as well as where you can submit your story about any eerie experiences you've had, which I would love to hear about. Just go to the Submit Your Story tab. Please subscribe to our channel so that you receive notification of when we release a new show. And find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. This is where I usually live stream and where I give you a behind-the-scenes look at locations where new episodes are being filmed at. I also tell you about all the interesting guests that will be appearing soon on Stories of the Supernatural. I hope you enjoy the show, and I think you are all wonderful. Hi guys, it's Marlene from Miami Ghost Chronicles, and no, the audio is not off track it's just that for some reason on this fantastic interview that I did with Patrick Orozco my audio did not come out luckily I did so what I want to do is I'm just going to fill in with what I know I said but anyway here on this introduction okay I do talk about the guest that I have which his name is Patrick Henry Orozco Orozco and uh, he is an author he is made films and He's a solo ghost hunter, and he had his first ghost experience when he was just five years old, okay, plus he's into exploring, and uh, he says back in the 2000s with the advent of the ghost hunting TV shows is when he really got into going to some of these places to do investigations. Uh, He's been writing, including movie scripts, and um, this is at the time that he decided to get into not only going on these investigations, but going by himself. He is a graduate in 2006 from the University of Texas in San Antonio, and he does live and work in San Antonio. Back earlier this year, February of 2018, he released his book, Timeline, Solo Overnight Explorations of Some of America's Most Haunted Locations. And as you will see, he is not only going to talk about his prior experiences, but he just came back from a trip throughout the Midwest where he went to several haunted locations. Well, you'll hear about that. And like I said, you'll hear me dubbing things along as we go. So guys, uh, enjoy. This is a fantastic interview with Patrick. So Patrick, what was that first experience that you had with the paranormal that you mentioned occurred when you were only five years old? If you could tell us about that. It happened um, the day my grandfather died, which was on Father's Day in uh, 1968. And uh, me and my cousin George, we used to hang out a lot. We all lived on the same block. My grandparents lived to the left of us, and then my cousins lived to the right. And at some point early in the morning, uh, we started to hear a lot of commotion coming from my grandmother's house, a lot of crying, screaming, that kind of stuff. That's because my grandmother had just been informed. Um, And we were on our way over to see, well, what's going on? We we didn't know. We just knew that there was something happening. And my sister caught up to us and said, no, no, come back here, come back to the house. She sat us down in the carport and said, don't move, just stay there until I get back and I'll go see what's happening. And so we sat, just kind of wondering what's going on. And that's when we saw the gate to my house open on its own, swing open, and then swing back, close. Yeah, um, and of course, um, George took off running. And I thought he was gonna run to the backyard, but no, he kept going. He, and he jumped, he jumped the fence. Yes. <laughs> he left me there, you know, he fell over the fence, he ran into his house, and I, you know, I'm in the backyard by myself. And they kind of tried to figure out what is going on, and uh, and yeah, it was it was frightening because I thought you know I thought that doesn't happen, and we knew you know that's that's not supposed to happen. Gates don't open on their own and close on their own. So that was my yeah that was my first experience with the paranormal. <laughs> 
so funny. I think that that is so funny because, uh, as I say, you know, you know, people that I've interviewed when they're a child and they have those experiences, they do one of two things. Either they engage in it like you did or they do like your cousin. They bolt out of mm-hmm. there and they never, ever, yeah. ever want to have anything whatsoever to do with the paranormal again. And so tell me what happened <laughs> after this experience uh, like you said, that you were aware that this is even at that age that this was not normal. What happened after that? Did you have any other experiences with the paranormal? I did have another significant ex- experience. Um, my grandmother eventually got got uh, fell and broke her hip, and and she moved in with with us in our house, and my mom took care of her. And so my, my oldest brother moved into my grandmother's house and he had this really amazing stereo. This was what in the seventies, yeah, mid seventies, maybe no late seventies. And I was over there at, at my, what used to be my grandmother's house, listening to, to the, to the stereo, just playing records as loud as I could play them. And this was, you know, an hour, an hour and a half, two hours. I'd call friends, talk on the phone. And uh, at, the, at the end of the evening, all my brother wanted me to make sure is that all the doors were locked. And I turned off all the lights. So I was going through, through that routine, turning everything off. The house was pitch black. I was about to leave the front door when I hear this very loud, audible sigh. I mean, practically in my face. And that really, really freaked me out. <laughs> I mean, I was a kid, you know, I was like 16, 17, something like that. And I, I, I ran to the street. I locked the door, ran to the street, and, and went back home immediately. And uh, as I walked into my house, obviously, it was, it, they could see it on my face. They could see I was probably white as a sheet. And they said, what the hell happened? What's wrong with you? And I told them what happened. And, and they, it, everybody kind of just took it in a stride, like, oh, it's probably, you know, it's probably your grandfather. And it was probably irritating, irritating him with that loud music. <laughs> yeah volumes Patrick because mostly when you're a teenager you yeah. are not paying attention yeah to that got my any attention. of this stuff <laughs> uh, for example I tell you know I've told this story before uh, when I was a teenager and you know I was like 16 years old and I had a boyfriend and he was a bus boy so he would get home like around midnight he would work on the weekends yeah and this was a once upon a time when there was just landlines and I would take that cord and pull it as far as it would go. And I would sit in the hallway, um, mm-hmm. you know, where I lived and my mom would be asleep in her room and I would be there talking to him. And of course this is like around 1.00 AM and it was really quiet outside. And a couple of times I would hear like the chain link fence, like, you know, when the gate, uh, when you uh-huh. jiggle it, And the first few times, of course, I'm thinking, that's a cat. That's a cat making that noise or getting on it. But after a while, you realize, Mm -hmm. um, even though you're really distracted, that that is, it it would have to be a really heavy cat. And we didn't have cats, by the way. But, and then a couple of times, (laughs) um, I ended up actually hearing some, and by the way, there was no trees out here on the the yard. We only had one big pine tree. And I actually heard somebody walking around in our yard. And to the point, I wasn't thinking anything paranormal. I immediately went running and I jumped in my mom's bed, telling her, screaming, hey, there's somebody outside. There's somebody in the yard. So, of course, she wakes up. She's all groggy, but she turns off all the lights. And we're going from window to window, looking through the in the darkness in the yard. And of course, there's nobody out there. By the way, this is a residential neighborhood. Again, around 1 a.m., it's absolutely super quiet. We never yeah. heard any steps of anybody running away or anything like that. And to be honest with you, I had grown up on this block, and I had lived across the street. And this house originally had been owned by a couple. They had a daughter, raised her, and she moved away. Yeah. And eventually, yeah. the old man, he died, and the widow, that's when she decided to rent out the house. I have a feeling that this was who was uh, that we would occasionally hear or I would occasionally hear because my poor mom 
she was the poor recipient of every time that I would be listening to these things going on. And I mean, I had other experiences later on, which looking back at them now, I realized that they were paranormal, uh, that there was something going on. But yeah, uh, as far as that's how you realize when you're a teenager, that something intrudes on you, that there is just no escaping it at all of what it is that you are experiencing and um, so then what happened with you, Patrick? Where, yeah. where, where did you go after that yeah. as far as the interest in the paranormal? It, it, it didn't resurface for me until um, the advent of, of the, the, the now popular ghost hunting shows on television. And, uh, and that's, that's at a time when I'd gone back to college to get my degree. And Wednesday, I remember it was always Wednesday night. And I, I had no idea that there were there were even those types of shows. I, I I knew about paranormal groups, but I had no idea it was on television. So I yeah I got really interested in it. It was fun to watch, and I started to it, it all those experiences that I had before the interest started to get peaked again for me. And I wondered I wonder if I could do that alone. <laughs> I wonder if I could go to those places. You know that you were very brave to do that because not everybody does this solo. <laughs> or or very dumb. So here you are, Patrick. <laughs> You've decided that you're going to get into paranormal, you know, investigation. So what what did you do? Did you yeah. how, where did you decide to go to first? Uh did you try to do it solo? How how did that work out for you because um how was that first experience because now you're an adult? And, you know, one thing is what you see on the TV and then another thing is realities. Yeah. yeah. What happened when you or how did you decide to or where to go where you had that first experience? But uh, by the way, you know, I, I, I'm still I still want to know how it was um, yeah. that you decided to go solo because like I said before, there's a lot of people out there that will absolutely do the ghost hunting part, except the I'm by myself thing. No, I, I really wanted to. And um, the first place I went to, uh, it was more like a test. And I, I was going to be part of a bigger group. And that's uh, Waverly Hills Sanatorium in, uh, in Kentucky and in Louisville. And, and that's kind of where I tested it out because even though I was in a group, it was only a group of about 11 or 12 people and they had all kind of come together. So if they went off in one direction in the hospital, I'd take off as fast as I could in the opposite direction just to go, you know, just go poke around in, in video and see how it felt to be solo in a place like that. And I mean, I just, it, it felt great. I felt very at ease, relaxed. And I thought, yeah, I think I can do this. I think I can go to these places solo. And, and, and and what really cemented cemented it for me was when I did have to be with the group, they were very loud and talkative and they were just snapping, flashing pictures and, and, and flashlights and oh, I just thought, yeah, groups are not for me. <laughs> you know what I perfectly understand because I have had that group experience where sometimes yeah. you do need the body count if you're doing an extensive investigation. But at yeah. the same time, it can be very distracting, and I have done yeah. both. I've gone to locations by myself, and uh, yeah, you might not be able to have as much equipment, but you are able to pick up a lot more, yeah. and uh, yeah. basically using, I think, one of the best equipment we have, which is our bodies. Uh, if you know how to tune in, yeah. and you are aware of what's going on. And then what happened? I had great experiences. Um, one of the most memorable experiences there was, was with the shadow people. And, and that's what that place is known for. It's known for its shadow activity, and which I did find. And I had a, a really interesting experience uh, on the fourth floor right outside of the uh, surgical units uh, where I had an experience with a very large black entity, I guess I, I can call it, because I was... Yeah, I was looking down the hallway, and, and I started to see some shadow activity. And it's very, very fast. Sometimes you, 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 you almost question it. You're almost not sure if you actually saw what you saw. But this one was unmistakable because I was looking down the hallway, and it was a, a full moon. 
and there was moonlight coming in on both sides of the hallway through the open doorways. And suddenly the, the hallway started to get a lot darker and it was, and it was approaching me. It was getting closer and closer to me. And every time it got closer, it would block out the light from coming into the windows, the moonlight. Yeah. And it, it got up to about 10 feet from me and then it stopped. And I thought, what is this? So I walked toward it and it backs away from me really fast. And, and I thought, okay, the, the most logical thing I thought, well, and there must be clouds and you must have, the clouds must have blocked out the moonlight. So I went out to the balcony and, and Waverly Hills is known for their balconies because that's where they would put their patients, you know, they roll them out into the fresh air. And I look up in the sky and there's not a single cloud in the sky. Well, there goes that theory of the moonlight. Yeah. So I thought, okay, well, I went back and I sat down again at the end of the hallway and it starts to happen again in the exact same way. It's this darkness that keeps getting closer and closer to me. I stand up, it stops, I walk toward it and it backs away from me again really fast. I'm thinking, what? It, yeah, it, it's reacting to me. It, 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 yeah, exactly. It, I did feel that there was some sentience there. There was some intelligence. Um, and it was, it's interesting that it, that it did back away from me. So I thought, okay, let's see if I can make this happen one more time. But unfortunately, that's when I started to see flashes and flashlights coming my way. And the group was finally catching up to me. And I had to abandon my sweet spot there. So, so Patrick, here you are. You did that test, yeah. which is so interesting. So you you realized, I can be out here by myself. And I'm not going to panic. You know, and bolt out the front door. As a matter of fact, it sounds like you were really comfortable. And I totally understand uh, what you were saying as far as that. It can be distracting, especially if you're in a group that's not really professional or quiet or they just don't understand. Mm. So I think this was a great experience uh, as far as testing. Yeah. Yeah. What? Yeah. It's a great place. It's an awesome, uh, awesome What you place. wanted to do when you were doing um, investigations? You know, you yeah. you, you passed mm-hmm. that litmus test, which, by the way, a lot of people don't bother to do. So, and I know that this place is intense. That was it. When I saw them coming up the hallway there with their flashlights, and I saw flash pictures, and I thought, oh, you just ruined this for me. You know, uh, that's when I realized, yeah, I'm gonna have to do this alone, solo. Uh, so yeah, I, I came back home and and started researching, looking at locations that were that were affordable and and accessible to me. And uh, the following year, I went to five additional locations: four on the East Coast and one here in Texas. So Patrick, on these places that you went to, what type of experiences did you have? Because like I say, a supernatural is not an on-demand thing. And sometimes things do happen. You're there at the right time. And then other times you go and nothing happens or it's a very low key. Um, everywhere I went, I had I had something happen, something significant happen. Uh, the, the least... The least uh, activity was on the battleship USS North Carolina. It turned out to be fairly quiet. I didn't. I had only one brief little shadow experience, but it was out of the corner of my eye. It, it, like I barely caught it, so I kind of had to throw that one out because I didn't see it, you know, in front of me. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, every place had something. Something significant happened. Uh, one of the noisiest places. It was, it was a toss-up between Fort Mifflin and West Virginia State Penitentiary. Um, Fort Mifflin in the Commandant's. Are you talking about Moundsville Prison? It is Moundsville, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I yeah, had a chance to uh, also go to Moundsville a couple of years ago. <laughs> and, you know, um, you realize... You, you you don't quite capture the atmosphere when you see it on the TV. It's not until you go there that you realize uh, how, first of all, how small the cells were, what kind of life it was. Uh, from what I understand, they had minimal staff there. And um, mm. I believe there was uh, yeah. also that area yeah. uh, downstairs. I believe it was called the Sugar Shack, which is the guards wouldn't even go down there. So a lot of tragic and horrible things happened uh and yes, i believe was, also yeah. that at one point um Ma- a manson was from that area yeah 
and yeah. he put in a request that he wanted to be transferred over to Moundsville in order to be close to his family. And of course, yeah. from what I understand, they turned him down because no warden wanted to put up with the problems that came, like housing somebody like Manson. It, yeah. Yeah, and they also have on display old the Sparky, uh-huh. old Sparky uh, the I electric think. chair, I think it was. Yeah, yeah, even though it's behind a case, yeah, and, that really uh, put out some vibes. Um, yeah, the funny thing about the Manson story, and I don't know if this is true or not, the gal who gave me the tour that night was was like a cousin or, or, or kind of related to Manson himself. And I thought, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, because he is from that area, yeah. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize the notoriety and the headaches that come that if you have an inmate like a Charlie yeah, Manson, yeah. what that means. And if they were already short on personnel, having to put in the extra manpower to look over Charlie Manson. But he seems to have done well because the prison system took mm-hmm. pretty decent yeah. care of him. I mean, uh, yeah. I believe he didn't. He passed away not too long ago, and he was a pretty old guy. And it makes you wonder, Patrick, where is he now, huh? A few months ago, so yeah, he might he might be there now. You're right; he could be there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, think about it. Uh, this is close to home, even though for somebody uh, usually had spent as much time in prison as he did. Uh, yeah. Prison is home, but it's like well, maybe. Maybe this is the prison closest to home. But, yeah, there was a lot of dark things that went on there. Uh, that prison, it, it had its, you know, when yeah. I went, there was, it was a very small group. And I was just with my husband. It was like an, a, kind of an impromptu stop by. But, yeah, there's a lot of eerie things going on there. I mean, there's that hallway where I, I can't remember the lady's name yeah. that took the picture of what was thought to be a shadow guy all the way at the end of that hallway and uh not till you there till you really yeah. see how small those cells were and some of them were piled in there three to a cell and i mean life must have been hell like that considering that um right. a lot of the yeah. the guys that were there were criminals obviously but yeah a lot of horrific things must have happened there so i'm not surprised that there's a lot okay. of uh, intelligent and malevolent uh, experiences or hauntings going on there Ooh. Yeah, including that area they used to call the Sugar Shack, which was no man's land. Nobody would go there. The Sugar Shack, yes, that's the yeah, that's a that's also yeah. So Patrick, you know the feeling I got, even though I I didn't take you know any type of recording uh, equipment with me at that time, was that <laughs> obviously besides the things that are known, there's I'm sure there's horrific things that happen there that are unknown, and the, like a lot of these prisons. Uh, you know that there's intelligent and malefic- yeah. maleficent entities there, besides the residual stuff. And I'm curious, especially a guy by himself, uh, what happened when you were there? Um, what experiences yeah. that you had? Did, 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 I'm very curious to see what you experienced. Well, that's a funny thing, is that I, this was the one place I thought I would feel that negative energy, that I would feel the most amount of dread. And it, it was it was the opposite for me. I was super relaxed. It was really fun to be there. It, it, such a fascinating place. I'd never been inside a prison uh, like that. And, I, you know, I, I never knew what it was like. What was it like to be inside? And that's another one of the things that really interests me about uh, doing this is that you get to go into these places that most people probably wouldn't want to go, especially alone at night. <laughs> uh, so yeah, you know, the only place that I felt a little bit of dread was in the hole. Uh, and, and, and that, and I also had a lot of bats in there with me. So it was at one point there were so many bats. I just had to, I just finally had to just uh, abandon the place. Cause it, yeah, there were just tons of bats in there. <laughs> So, uh, in fact, one of yeah, yeah, yeah. When one of them finally hit my camera, I said, "No, nope, you gotta go." <laughs> 
yes, I think that's the point where I say, oh, this is over, bats, thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> Absolutely not. So I know where you were coming from. And that's another thing. Uh, you know, people were, they. you know, I think I, me and one other person of the whole group yeah. uh, was actually able to go into the cells happily and just sit down to have yeah. that experience. Because the majority of people, yeah. all they do is, they're like, yeah, I'll look at you do it, but absolutely not. I am not about <laughs> to go inside that cell and experience what it was like. So, yeah, I know what you mean. I spent a lot of time in the cells. Yeah. Just, and, yeah. And oh, that's yeah. what I mean, which is yeah. I know that people definitely, if they're afraid even to step inside a cell and have that experience and there's a group of people around – that's why I'm so sure that very few, very few people do mm-hmm. what you do, which is the solo ghost hunting. Yes. Uh, because yes. believe me, the last thing a lot of people, it's almost like mm-hmm. if something's going to happen to me, I want it. I want to have company. Yeah. You know, I want either we're all going down or somebody's going to need to save me and get me out of here. How about other experiences? Have you really had this experience where you encountered something malevolent and unexpected? Yes, that was, uh, in fact, that was, that was just last year, and it was close by. I was at Yoakum, the old Yoakum Community Hospital uh, in Yoakum, Texas. And I had actually been in there a, a month before with, with a group. I had been invited to go with a group to, to spend some time with them. And, um, but then they, they let me go in alone, and, and that's where, where I started doing some sensory deprivation kind of stuff, experiments. Um, but uh, on my return visit, when I had the place to myself, when I soloed it a month later, which was almost exactly a year ago, uh, it had been pretty quiet, and I, and I was upstairs on the second floor, and uh, all of a sudden, I started to hear very loud crashing, banging sounds coming from the ICU area, and the ICU area is completely sealed off. So I knew immediately, okay, that's either somebody else, somebody got in here, and they're in there with me or it's paranormal. So I go into ICU uh, and, and it was, the sounds were so loud that they, they went, they peaked my audio levels on all my devices. Uh, yeah, uh, they were so loud that I felt them, they were percussive. And I go into ICU and there's, there's nobody in there, there's nothing broken, it sounded like a big plate glass, a window had been thrown on the ground. Nothing. I, I didn't find anything in there. So while I'm poking around in there trying to figure out, well, how, how, trying to debunk it, trying to figure out is there any way this could have happened outside in the hallway, right where my static camera is, the sounds start again. And it sounds like somebody taking a big two by four and then smashing the walls as hard as they could. And so I come out to the hallway again, you know, I'm asking, you know, who's here? Who's doing this? There's no other sounds. I don't hear any other person running away or laughing or giggling because you know when humans do that they're going to give their give themselves away and here i didn't hear anything i only heard these crashing sounds and that's the first time i had a a real fear response because my you know because it's, it's automatic your brain's telling you this is weird you know this isn't supposed to happen you need to be really careful uh which i was because you know i am alone uh, this thing sounded like it was angry and like it had a lot of energy. Um, about a, another couple of minutes, it's way, way down the hall and it's doing it again. It's like really just throwing things around, crashing things. And then after, immediately after that, it just went dead silent, like, like it left. And at the end of the hallway, there was a broken out window that went right outside, you know. and. That's, that's the feeling I got. The feeling I got was that it was having a tantrum. It got really upset that I was up there. And it was forced to leave the building. And the one thing you, you never see on, you can't see or you can't feel on television is you, you see maybe something that happens and you might hear something that happens. But there's also a feeling to this that I think most people don't, don't realize. And to me, the only way I can describe it is it's kind of a, like a static energy, a very mild, like there's this energy. And, and when those last sounds happen, that stopped. 
and like I said, it went to dead quiet, and like it, it was gone. Yeah. So Patrick, uh, one of the things that yeah uh, happens yeah. when you're alone is that <laughs> you uh, don't have as many people to carry things. So how much equipment? What do you have with you on these explorations? I have usually four cameras, two video cameras, uh, and two GoPros. Uh, all of them are, and I'm shooting everything in, in infrared. I'll have two or three audio recorders, and that's pretty much it. Yes, yeah, sometimes too many gadgets. Yeah, I'm, I'm a very anti-gadget. Um, per, yeah. And, you know, personally, I think that one of the best gadgets is our body. Um I think that yeah, um, yeah. sometimes, uh, yeah. especially if you're tuned to it and you recognize it, you know when you're feeling certain things in your body uh, that, you know, you might have something supernatural coming near or about yeah. to take place. Uh, and after a while, when you've been doing this work, you kind of know how to tell uh, yes. when something like that happens. And um, exactly. equipment is great because it allows you to capture uh, a lot of information. Yeah. But I come yeah. from the time in the 90s when this was even pre-digital pho- photography. So when, we, in other words, it would cost you money to develop photographs. So you had to rely on more basic stuff. Right. And uh, this is where you yes. tuned in to what you were feeling and uh, as far as uh, photography or yeah. uh, EVPs especially, people don't realize that a lot of times it is much, much easier for uh, to capture an EVP as far as energy-wise from an entity. And, you know, and I always wondered why on television they were getting so little and why I had so much. It, I'm still, like, trying to figure that one out. Yeah, because, yeah. you know, in truth, uh, energy-wise, for an entity, it requires a lot less to manifest on audio. Uh, yeah. And I know sometimes you hear certain EVPs that, God, it could be anything. It, it's really difficult to discern if, in truth, right. what it is is yeah. something from the other yeah. side. Other yeah. times it's very clear uh, that you're actually catching an entire a phrase or you know, words that are intelligent and otherwise, especially if you've been asking questions along the way. uh, Or if, for example, what you're getting is a name, which is also very interesting. And that, in some cases, not all the the time, you know, it allows you to even go back and possibly validate, uh, depending on where you're at, either from newspapers or if it's a location, uh, yeah. well, let's say where the patients, patient records, but sometimes if if you're lucky, that's that's very slim. Yeah, yeah. But it does show some type oh, yeah. of um, intelligence kind. when you get those yeah. kind of EVPs, which are much more common. And another thing that people don't realize also is that when you go out there, it takes uh, it's very time consuming to go through all this evidence, yeah. whether it's just audio or video, because it's just not watching it. It's that you have to look very, very closely uh, to see if you capture something that might be off in a quarter or a shadow. Uh, so uh, what's your experience with this, Patrick? I, I almost never listen to anything on site um, because, I, again, it's kind of distraction. It kind of throws me off. I would prefer to just kind of come home and, and slowly take my time analyzing audio and video. Uh, but yeah, uh, there was only one place I went to that I didn't get a single thing. And that was here in Texas at, in Goliad at the old fort in, uh, Presidio La Bahia. I didn't get anything. I mean, nothing. Yeah. It, like they were on vacation or something that night. <laughs> yep. That's one of my favorite yeah. sayings, Patrick, that the supernatural is not an and yeah. man thing. That yeah. doesn't mean sometimes that. There's nothing there. Sometimes there is nothing there. And other times, uh, the timing is just yeah. not right for whatever reason. Uh, right. Sometimes I've heard yeah. of certain hauntings that are tied into certain anniversaries or even seasonal uh, or under certain weather conditions. Yeah. 
and uh, if your timing is not what it should be, you just are not able to capture stuff. Other times, if you have somebody that's sensitive, sometimes that you see an uptick uh, in interaction as in just more activity witnessed. And also, Patrick, what about bringing anybody home with you? Have you had any experiences along those lines? Yes. And I I suspect it was from Waverly. Because um, I I first edited that video in 2012, and I made a short little movie that I just passed around to my family and friends. And uh, a little bit later, when when I did the the uh, the f- five additional locations, I decided to put it in a series. And I thought I and I needed to re-edit it. And I was already living in the place I live now. And when I started working on that video, when I when I opened those files the very first time. It's when some sounds I had never heard before, loud clicking sounds, rustling sounds, knocking sounds, all coming from the, the closet uh, near the bathroom. I would hear the curtain, the shower curtain rustling. And I thought, what the? You know, and it, there were sounds that I've never heard before and I've never heard since. Once I finished re editing the, the Waverly Hills video, it stopped completely. Yeah, yeah. Really weird. And then, and then here's a story I've never told anyone. This was in 2012. I was living with my sister out of necessity. I, it was a big, complicated thing with my old apartment, and I had to vacate. So I lived with my sister, and that's when I went to Waverly Hills. And uh, in about a couple of weeks after I came back from Waverly Hills, she, she, was, she was a school teacher. This was my day off. On my day off, I would go do, run errands, and I'd come back. And I came back to the house about three o'clock and I was walking up the stairs to my room and I heard the sound of, of like a, a, either one little girl or two little girls laughing in my room. And I thought, what the? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I said, why, why are there kids in my room? And I thought, well, maybe my sister had to bring kids, you know, school kids with her for some reason. She's tutoring them or something. And I thought, but why are they in my room? <laughs> So I actually go up to my door and I actually knock on the door and say, hello, I'm coming in. And, you know, and of course, there's nobody in there. So I go to, to the only window. Yeah, I go to the only window in the room and I thought, I have to come from outside. But uh, I look and I can see all the four yards that, that surround her house and there's not a single person out there. So, yeah. <laughs> and see, this is what I mean. Here you are. You're not, a, you're not looking for the paranormal moment. You're coming home, yeah. and you even think that these are real kids. And, of course, yeah. the only question you have is, why are these kids in my room of all yeah. places? And then you have that shock moment, that exactly. crap moment. <laughs> There's no, it was, yeah. It's a tiny little bedroom, so we are. It's like, wow. Yeah. And you know what also makes me laugh about this, Patrick, is that, you know, sometimes, and I'm I'm the first one, you know, you always think of yeah. to have that experience, uh, whether it's visual or audio, you know, that you, like, what happened with you? You have to go to some spooky place or uh, some place has got a reputation for being haunted or people have had experiences. And sometimes yeah. it, it comes to you. It has, It comes to you. You don't have to look for it. And that's another thing I've pointed out, that exactly. when you do this work for a while, yeah. every once in a while, this stuff does happen. You know, usually it'll go away. Uh, but yes, you, when you least expect it, when you're not, mm-hmm. of course, have yeah. any equipment ready, uh, you have it and it kind of slaps you in the face. And like, you know, like I said, your first instinct is not yeah. to think that what you're experiencing is in any way paranormal you always go to the logical what could it be as in a live person and then mm, yeah. you have that oh okay that was not a live person and then and th- and th- that's what i also call the paradigm shift for paranormal yeah. investigators where yeah you weren't out on an investigation you didn't have equipment you weren't looking for it and like you said you have gone through a checklist of what it could possibly rationally be. 
and mm-hmm. nothing yeah. applies. So you're left with only one conclusion that it was paranormal and even if nobody was there to witness this, you understand what happened so patrick what happened when you just that trip that you just finished to the midwest what was that about oh absolutely yeah yeah um i was looking for for, for a different place of the country to go to go do this and midwest like who, who would have thought the midwest was so haunted <laughs> but but i mean I, I yeah i guess every place is, is, is just as haunted uh so yeah uh, i went to uh, melvern manor in melvern iowa yeah that's incredible i just interviewed josh heard last week oh yeah josh yeah yes josh as the co-owner of that place he really had some incredible stories to tell things that he has experienced just based on the history of that place it is incredible a uh, pretty creepy place, as you might imagine. Uh, and it, it, well, I mean, as all asylums probably are. <laughs> um, but for me, it was pretty quiet, uh, except when I was in in the most famous room there, which had uh, Gracie. Uh, and Gracie was a mental health patient. She had schizophrenia, uh, personality disorders, and uh, I kind of spent a good amount of time in her room with her. Uh, I lay down on her bed. I sat in her chair and that's when I heard uh, like a whimper. And this was more, this wasn't like later. I heard it on, on audio or anything. I heard it there in a room. It, this was a disembodied uh, a sound, a voice. And uh, a little bit later, right side, outside of her room, I did hear again, another disembodied voice. It was female, but I couldn't, I did not understand what she said. And then there at, uh, in the parlor area with the wheelchair, there's a wheelchair there that's supposed to, that, that sometimes Josh comes, comes the next day and he finds it, it's been, it's been moved somehow during the, during the night. So I thought that'd be a great place to, to um, do some uh, sensory deprivation uh, experiments. So that's where, yeah, so, I, so I, I sat on a wheelchair and I strapped my legs down with uh, tie downs, uh, and then I blindfold myself, and then I, I strap down my arm to the wheelchair. So that way there's, there's no way I can escape. <laughs> and maybe, you know, maybe by making myself that vulnerable, you know, something will want to come and, you know, push the wheelchair. And I kept saying, come on, push the wheelchair. Push me around, push me around. And uh, the only thing that happened, and I was wearing shorts, is that I felt something kind of like tickling my right knee. And it persisted. Yeah. And then... I thought, okay, well, I guess you got something for, for knees. <laughs> and, and I said, well, can you do more than that? Can you do more than that? And that's when my knee got super, super cold. And, and it was just my right knee right there. It just got really cold. Um, but that's, unfortunately, I didn't, get, I didn't get pushed on the wheelchair, which is what I really wanted to happen. Um, I mean, Melbourne Manor, it has quite a history, but especially during the... You know, when it was still like a home for people with disabilities, yeah. the thing is, and I discussed it with Josh, where a lot of people yeah. considered this place home. This is where they lived for like many, many, many yeah. years. So, of course, you know, things happen there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a lot of people, yeah, yeah, a lot of people um, also, when it was a hotel, it was originally a hotel and a lot of that, you know, Sometimes die. Um, yeah. Yes, that place has been around long enough that a lot of things yeah. have happened there. <laughs> yeah, but it, yeah, it, it was. It's a great place. It's an it's an awesome, awesome place. And yeah, that was the thing. Uh, as its incarnation as a hotel, it was like the one hotel in this small town. So, you know, yes, you had your mm-hmm, regular yeah. traveler that was just staying there, but a lot of things take place in hotels. It's, you know, that like that saying, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Well, that mentality sometimes was yeah. what was going on even back in the supposedly good old days where uh, just right. strange and unusual and bizarre and sometimes tragic things would happen at 
hotels. So where yeah. else did you go to, Patrick, on this trip? Uh, another place I went to, which was a bucket list location for me, because it was one of the first things I ever saw on television that piqued my interest again, which was the Sally House in Kansas, in Atchison, Kansas. Uh, creepy, creepy old house built in the mid-1800s by the Finney brothers. Um, the, the, the story that, that is attached to the house may or may not be true. It, it hasn't been substantiated. And that's of the little girl named Sally who died uh, from during a botched uh, appendicitis uh, appendix uh, operation. Uh, but again, you know, there's there's no there's no paperwork. There's there's no history that, that actually really happened there. However, lots of people did die in the house. Uh, a couple of the Finney family members died there. Some other people died. Yeah. Um, the most significant thing that happened there was in one of the bedrooms upstairs, where I was sitting in a chair in a bedroom, and there's furniture up there. There's beds and chairs, and I had one leg cross over the other. And I saw this little black shadow very close to the ground go around me. And just a few seconds later, I feel a tug on my shoelaces on that foot. Yeah. And, and I, again, you know, every time that happens, I say, can you do that again? Can you do that again? And, and, it, it, and unfortunately, I couldn't get it to happen again. And I, was, and I didn't have the camera on, on, my, on my shoe, but nothing happened. And, you know, I... When you say small, was this like a child or something very something low very to the close ground? to the ground? Something really small, yeah. Which I, which is which is more common than than anybody might think. There's just there's a lot of those. I, I actually do have one on video even that I just yeah uh, for when I went to Yoakum, uh, and it was the same thing. This little shadow very close to the ground, just kind of floating by. It went around me and behind me, and that's it. <laughs> And you know, Patrick, the thing about these locations is that, yes, you have your regular spirits and not only, because everybody thinks of non-human yeah. as the D word demons, but sometimes you do have non-human yeah. entities, which accounts for a lot of these weird shadows, like either the really small ones that you saw or the really yeah. tall ones that are just just entities quite different. And it depends. Sometimes they congregate where there's been human tragedy or agony. Other times they've been invoked for some reason. I'm not really yeah. sure what their source is or where they come from. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yes, sometimes uh, things like this do occur. They have, yeah, yeah. And, 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 if, and of course it was a doctor's office, so if anybody came in with uh, fatal injuries, maybe, you know, maybe some of them died there. But again, it's very difficult to get records. It's very difficult to get anything, you know, on paper about the place. It's just some of those things. Some, some of the deaths have been recorded, and, and it was mostly the Finney family uh, that died there. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's really interesting what you said, that at one time it was a doctor's office because, you know what, yes, people did die of a lot mm -hmm. of diseases that now we have cures for or vaccines yeah. or inoculations or but back then you yeah. could very easily die from the simplest thing yeah you could get a cut and it would go septic um, <laughs> like uh that oh, story yeah. about the little girl that she died from an appendicitis attack that was unattended or that was misdiagnosed same thing you know, you know we're so used to calling 911 and you get transported mm -hmm. and you have a 12 team, 12 person team ready to handle even traumatic injuries that yeah. uh, we don't realize that back in those years, yeah. you were lucky if you had one doctor in the town and sometimes right. either he didn't have the skill or he just didn't have the equipment mm -hmm. to save people with traumatic injuries or sometimes it could just be the simplest thing, uh, depending was <laughs> Even if they had the ability to yeah. x-ray, uh, you could be misdiagnosed or just simply die from something very, very simple. Right. I and mean, back then, people were dying from gastritis. I mean, it, it, yeah. You know, and the reason that I bring that up is as far as it comes to hauntings is that, yes, people were more accepting because that, that, that death yeah. could happen. You know, child mortality was higher and... 
Uh, from what I understand, even life expect- expectancy was shorter. But still, uh, there were moments Quickly. when yeah. people were yeah. just not expecting <laughs> to die quite so suddenly. Or in some cases where, let's say, in the case of the Sally House, where they actually died there. And maybe they went there um, yeah. to meet with a doctor hoping that they were going to be saved. Or let's say you took your child maybe thinking it was something simple and it turned out to not be or you took the child but when it was too late or you yourself went or somebody went when yeah. it was just too late and inevitably you know that people ended up passing away there in that house so that yes that could contribute to the hauntings and yeah. Uh, yeah, so what happens yeah. when uh, as far as planning the next location it was fun yeah I really enjoyed it it was time it was time for me to be alone in the dark again you know I was Going a little stir crazy at my job. And I have to get out of here. <laughs> yes, I totally understand where you're coming from. And you know what? This is also how you realize that what you're doing is a passion. When you know you're you're ready, planning where you want to go to, uh, you know, in the smallest detail, and the absolutely, uh, yeah. like you said, you 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 develop this this expectations <laughs> of like I want to yeah. go to this place. I want to capture. But at the same time, I want to be yeah. totally, I don't want it to be subjective. I want it to be a professional investigation. As much as I would like to capture evidence, um, you always go there with a mindset of yeah. it's got to be authentic. Otherwise, it's not worth it. So, Patrick, yeah. um, I know that you went to some other places, like you just stated before, that you didn't realize that the Midwest was actually as haunted as it was. What was the uh, next stop for you? Um, I'm going to say uh, the, the the last place I went to in the Midwest, uh, on my Midwest jaunt was uh, the Villisca Axe Murder House. And this one turned out to be, it, yeah, this one was the first time that something messed with my head that really messed with my head. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, well, it, it was in the kid's room and this is a, a horrible, horrible, sad story of this horrible man that went into this family's home and, and murdered everyone with an ax and, and hit everybody exactly on, on the upper uh, top half of of the head, like there there weren't any axe hits below the jawline. Just a horrible, horrible, tragic story where children were were axed to death. But um, in the kids' room, uh, um, I was sitting on the floor and I was just just kind of just getting a, a feel for the room and asking, "Is who's here? You know, what's your name?" I started to have these really intense visions of this man coming up the stairs with with an axe. <laughs> And I couldn't, and I couldn't shake it. I couldn't shake it. You know, like I tried to concentrate on, on where I was and what I was doing and asking questions, but that, that, that imagery kept like really getting into my head. And, um, I had been warned about it. I had been warned that, that, that that's what happens in that house uh, is that, you yeah, know, that there's something, there's either entities there or, or entities that, that, uh, and here's my, my thinking about this place. I don't think it's any of the kids. I don't think it's any of the family. Because why on earth would you want to go back to that scene? Why would you want to go back to the place where you were brutally, brutally, horribly murdered? Yeah. So I think it's something else. I think there's something else there that maybe someone else brought from another location. Maybe I brought it from another location. I don't know. And you know what? You're absolutely right. Um I want to say that sometimes, what, 98% of your visitors to some of these locations, they're just there to have the experience, whatever it's going to be for them. And then, you know, sometimes you say, you know, sometimes people do bring things with them, especially like if they've just come from another location. But I've found in yeah. sometimes you do get yeah. people that go to these locations just because, believe it or not, they identify more with the killer or with whatever yeah. grisly yeah murder took place there uh almost what they want to is experience or encourage that darkness mm-hmm. that occurred there uh and sometimes i think that when you get people like that that go to these locations of course under the guise of just being regular old 
uh, people or investigators just going there to just to visit a haunted house, they're really um, either when somebody's not watching right. them or mentally they're invoking yeah. or encouraging or even trying to open up uh, doorways uh, of that darkness that they're trying to encourage. Yeah. And I myself, you know, when you go to these yeah. places, obviously, uh, especially when it has a history like the Velisca Axe House that is very dark, people don't realize that, or sometimes even if it was abandoned or shut down for a while, for some reason, places like this become a magnet for people to go in there and do ceremonies and rituals. And yeah, yeah. then maybe later on, they patch everything up and it's repainted or everything is good and nobody is the wiser yeah. Yeah, right. of <laughs> what was invoked or what was brought into that space. Some things that are very dark. Um, yeah, yeah, yes, I'm like, right, yeah. <laughs> what you described that base, what they do is they play with your head. They look into your mind somehow or other. I'm not sure how this would happen, but they kind of play onto your fear because that's what they thrive off yeah. of. They thrive yeah. off of the fear that they can cause and actually what happened there before. It's, 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 it's tiny. <laughs> it's a tiny little house. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't see, I, I don't understand how you could possibly want to bring in more than maybe one or two people because <laughs> it's just so small. I can't imagine a big team in there. Yeah, I believe that it is a very small house. And I've seen a couple of interviews of people that actually rented this location, you yeah. know, between after that time and, you know, through the intervening years. And they claimed that there was some yeah. very unusual activity that occurred while they were there. And, uh, and, and, and another thing that had to do with his murder, as horrible as it was, and these children and everything, which yeah. absolutely uh, speaks of somebody that was You're bloodthirsty yeah. was that yeah. the culprit was yeah. never caught i mean i know they had several suspects and this and that and very and this is another thing that you know they look at it as well there was a disagreement with um whether it was over business or i mean but if you take away whatever the reason was that somebody decided that they were going to go in there the fact that whoever did it was able to not only kill human beings but kill yeah. all these children uh, speaks volumes that you were talking about a very yeah. deeply disturbed, dark, and malevolent person who could go and do that. And chances are uh, that this was yeah. not an isolated incident. I'm sure this person must have done it before and probably went on to do it again. And yeah. uh, one of the other things that I think is very interesting that you think yourself, like you described, this is such a small house that uh, this is a phenomenon that I've seen associated with some very dark places where no uh, noise was ever heard. And I believe one of the things that they thought of was mm -hmm. that this, the perpetrator had already snuck into the house and was upstairs in the attic and waited for everybody yeah. to go to sleep and then went down and killed them all. But no noise was ever heard. Uh, nothing to alert the family, the creaking of wood, nothing like that. And the same thing happened with the Amityville uh, murders, the defails. All these gunshots are heard in a quiet residential area. Nobody wakes yeah. up. There was uh, another, um, I, they call the Easter yeah. Sunday slayings. I, I, don't, I think it was in the 70s or 80s, or yeah. 80s. I don't remember exactly. Yeah. Same thing. A <laughs> uh, guy, he, he becomes a family annihilator. He wipes out his brother, mm -hmm. his brother's wife, his various children, and his mom. And what happened was he he was living with his mother, and, and of course the whole family right. had uh, come to the house because it was Easter Sunday. And he decided he just went downstairs yeah. to, or upstairs to his room, comes back down, and kills everybody yeah. with with gunshot, shoots everybody. And this is in the middle of a day on a Sunday, in the middle of a residential area, and nobody hears the gunshot yeah. blasts. Because um, mm -hmm. you could say, okay, maybe one shot, people put it off to firecracker. Nobody hears multiple yeah. shots. And as a matter of fact, the only way that the police became aware of the murder was yeah. uh, after 
it had been completed and later on he was the one that called the police and uh talked about it so yeah that's uh so what else happened uh, I'm trying to get the either the Lexington, which is close by, that's in uh, Corpus Christi on the coast here, or uh, some other uh, USS um, battleship or carrier. Um, I'm looking. I'm, I, I, yeah, I'm looking into trying to get the, something like that. Um, I uh, probably next year I'll return to the East Coast, go to maybe some locations that I haven't been to. Still kind of kind of looking to see. Uh, this trip originally was going to be a, a New York trip because there's a couple of locations in, in Massachusetts and in New York, upper state in New York, that I really wanted to get to. But unfortunately, it just this is just how it worked out. So, so Patrick, I imagine you haven't had a chance to review any of your footage, right? Unfortunately, no. It it was yeah. I, I took a lot more video than I usually do. So uh, I I literally just stopped unloading or uploading video just two nights ago so it took a long time yeah yeah but no i haven't had a chance to look at anything so patrick what are you going to do now are you going to put together some type of documentary uh how are you going to weave this together uh as Um, far as uh to i guess what go through the highlights of the evidence you captured what are you What are you going to do? Because I'm sure you captured a lot of interesting stuff. Yeah, well, I do actually. I did. I did uh, do a series, a web series for the six locations that I uh, went to in 2013, 20 to 2015. Yeah, and uh, there's a yeah, and I've got a website uh, www.timelinesshow.com. That's two S's, timelines show, and all the videos are are there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I guess what you're not going to do them per se a series like what you did previously. So what what are you going to do with this uh, material? It is. I, I'm not going to do a series, no. But I'm going to uh, look in, I'm thinking about doing uh, just a, a whole uh, the whole documentary about all the locations, all in just one little one little short movie. Yeah. Yes, and I totally understand that even before you get into production you have to uh, sit there and review it. And unlike some other places, which have got boatloads of people to review both audio and video, when you are by yourself, it can be really time consuming to not only review it, but then pull out what you want about how long do you think it'll be? Yeah. Uh, It's going to take me probably about a year to go through all this stuff. Yeah. It's a lot. (laughs) Patrick, I take it, What are you already planning your uh, next trip, the next locations that you're going to go mm. to? Because I know that for you, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. Looking forward this to is, it. you know, I know there's a lot of planning uh, that's involved with it. Uh, where are you going to next? Um, it, it depends. Um, the locations I went to this time, this uh, just a couple of weeks ago, were so close by that I based out of um, for one for two locations I based out of Omaha and then for the last location I was in Kansas. So I'll fly I'll fly to the nearest city, and then rent a car and then and then yeah, yeah yeah. And you know I also wanted to know because especially on the car trips, have you ever had any hitchhiker somebody that wants to come along and keep you company? I, yeah, I went to the USS North Carolina. I got this EVP of this male who, when I said, can you tell me your name? And the response was four eyes. And I wear glasses. Yeah, I, I, I wear, you know, I'm short sighted. I'm, I'm nearsighted. So, and I, I'm pretty sure he was, he was referring to me. I think he was making fun of me. And here's a funny thing is that a couple of nights later, I'm at Fort Mifflin, and I'm asking the same thing. I'm in the commandant's quarters, and it's hard to hear it, but there's a voice again that says, hi, four eyes. <laughs> so, and, and that there is a, 
yeah, there's a story of this this very uh, mischievous spirit that's on that USS uh, battleship, the North Carolina, that will get in your car if you don't, and try to spook you. <laughs> You know, that's one of the things, Patrick, that uh, <laughs> I was always cautious about that because that's another thing. When you do this type of work, uh, there's yeah, yeah. something yeah. that's oh. attractive about you when it comes to hitchhiker ghosts. And, you know, not all of them are bound to locations. Yeah. Some of them are free, free floating. And if you're either sensitive or, of course, trying to communicate with them, they take it as an open invitation yeah. and they want to hang out with you. Plus, yeah. A lot of them, uh, uh, they still have the personalities they had when they were alive, whether it's, whether they were a prankster or just jerks or what, you know, they just, or they're trying, like what this one was calling you four eyes. Uh, yeah, they still retain that, those qualities, those personality qualities. So uh, do you think you're going to be taking anybody yeah. with you on your next trip? Probably not. And <laughs> I'm just kidding because I know that that you really enjoy this solo uh, endeavor, That's which right. personally yeah. I yeah. think is super <laughs> admirable uh, because in truth, I know because of so many years I've done this, that there's very, very yeah. few paranormal investigators. I'm not even going into regular people, very few uh, investigators that will go out there and do what you do. And uh, where can people go to find out more uh, about you? Yeah, it's www.timelinesshow.com. That's Timelines Show, two S's. Uh, and yeah, there's pictures, there's videos, um, and, there, and you can find out how to get my book on Amazon. Patrick, I want to thank you so very much for the time you spent here. You have been wonderful. You too. Thank you, Marlene. I appreciate it. Bye-bye. So what did you guys think? You know, I always ask you the same thing. I I thought it was a terrific interview. Plus, I am not kidding you. Uh, there's, I think I could count on one hand the amount of people that will do what he does. Okay. I've gone into places by myself, but in truth, I always have a lookout. I mean, I've gone in groups, but I always have a lookout because um, it's just safer. And especially if you go into some of these places, not like a, a, a location where where there's a manager or somebody. I'm talking about, you know, sometimes you go on to like an urban exploration kind of location that gets reputation. And the reason why I say this is that uh, sometimes you have to really be careful, number one, because you could run into a live person uh, that is there and is not supposed to be there. And sometimes the more remote the place is, the more attractive it is mostly because, for example, maybe the police don't even go out there. So going out there to one of these locations, you could run into more than one person that you really don't want to run into. Uh, or if you have an accident that happens, uh, a lot of these locations, they're not safe. You know, they've got rotted wood, rotted flooring. A million things can happen, and if you're by yourself, uh, you might need somebody to call for help or you need an emergency uh, somebody to get you out of there. So again, you know, as far as uh, when you're going to some of these places, absolutely, you have to take care of yourself. You know, you want to interact with the dead, not become one of them before it's your time. And you know what? I, I've run across several stories of investigators and legend trippers going on to places uh, and ending up getting killed because they either took falls that were pretty high up, things happened, and they just didn't expect it, they didn't do the research, and they ended up dead. And that's not really what you want. That's not really what this is about. The idea is to have a good time, but always to be safe. So for any of you that are going out there, if you want to do the solo stuff, then you would have to do something along the same lines as what Patrick does, which is where he's going to locations where it's, for lack of a better word, it's a controlled location. All right. Uh, and in an emergency, you've got somebody there that you can reach out to and that's going to help you. Plus, they've already taken pains to more or less um, qualify the place as being safe. 
So some of those things that um, that he talked about, let me tell you, I think that is so super interesting. Uh, his the aspect that he's coming at this from because that thing about that sensory deprivation that's another thing. Forget the being alone part when you start talking about sensory deprivation tying yourself down a blindfold uh i'm telling you most people is like are you kidding me like if something touches me and i need to go screaming i want to be able to run screaming out immediately so uh that's another thing i i'm telling you i don't even think i would do that i think that that's where yeah that's where um that's where I know I, I I know my limitations, and that would be one of them. Uh, I, it's like every you know I I know there's people out there that uh, they want to have that ultimate rush moment of with the supernatural, but you know what uh, I I don't think I could even go that far. But anyway, guys, I really hope you enjoy this show. Um, Absolutely, uh, make sure to go on Patrick's website and check out uh, his videos, his books, all the things that he's got. Maybe he does post things about the places that he's going to be going to. That would be super interesting. And also, uh, if you're, you know, catch me, don't forget, guys, uh, my true believers, write to me at Marlene at MiamiGhostChronicles.com. I've been creating some fantastic stories. I'm hoping to get more. Uh, so don't forget about me. Like I said, any type of stories, even if they're secondhand, even if they didn't happen directly to you or you heard about it, I want to hear about it. Uh, don't forget, you can also catch me on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram. You know, I live stream there. Plus, I also put on there a lot of the links to the shows. And you can go to MiamiGhostChronicles.com. I have links to the YouTube videos. I also have... Uh, links to mp3 files if you want to download the podcast version of the show plus there are also links to the podcast platforms where you can also download the show in case you know you have one of these that you that you absolutely love such as itunes iHeartRadio, spreaker mixcloud you can find me on all of those and all you have to do is go to miamighostchronicles.com and on that face page you're going to find the link directly to those locations. So guys, uh, again, I want to thank you for joining me. Um, I have a lot of fantastic guests coming on. I'm already working on season five of Stories of the Supernatural. And uh, like I said, I've got some interesting, fantastic guests. I'm also going to be putting together... Uh, every once in a while a show with different ghost stories because a lot of people are asking me that they want to hear stories about some of these locations so I am going to put together some shows where it's not necessarily an interview but I want to put together what are the best ghost stories about certain locations uh, with a little bit of history and you know some of them you know uh, some urban myths thrown in there into the mix because like everything you know a lot of these urban myths sometimes you you hear them and on the face of them they sound really fantastical but there's always a good good chance that there is a kernel of truth in there and uh, I'm also going to dig up you know that I love research and a lot of these places uh, when you do the research you discover you uncover some very disturbing stories much more disturbing actually than the urban myths about things that happen there so i'm going to put some shows together along those lines uh some of the well-known stories new stories ghost stories urban myths you know uh experiences that people have told me about because that's another thing when you do this work you get a lot of people that come up to you and tell you some really super interesting story about some locations uh, that you, you you just don't find in any of the text you know any of the books that you read about because it's just a moment that happens where somebody tells you a story and a lot of the times the person telling you the story starts it off with I've never told this to anybody before so you know that nine times out of ten you are going to hear something super interesting and believable because the reason that people don't say anything to anybody is because they are afraid of getting laughed at 
or being thought crazy. And they've walked around with this fantastic story about what, either one experience or several experiences that when they come across somebody that does the paranormal and that they feel pretty sure is not going to laugh at them or tell them that they're crazy, then they sometimes have the most fabulous and super interesting stories. And that's what I'm hoping I am going to bring. So again, guys, uh, thank you so much for being part of my audience and for sharing this time with me. Again, uh, go to MiamiGhostChronicles.com and you can see links to all the shows, all the new seasons, everything that's up and coming, or catch us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And don't forget, my true believers, to reach out to me with your story. Take care, guys.